Welcome to Confessing the Faith, a theological and devotional walk through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. I'm your host, Sam Waldron, one of the pastors of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky, and president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. In this talk, we once more return to chapter 8 and the subject of the work of Christ. And we will continue to consider the nature of the atonement by looking at and focusing on the key biblical word, propitiation. Propitiation is the focus and heart of the atonement. With regard to this important word, four things must be discussed. First of all, let me remind you of the mentions of propitiation in the New Testament. And these four mentions, according to J.R. Packer in My Place Condemned He Stood, affirm that its four occurrences in the New Testament occur with reference to four great truths. One, the rationale of God's justification of sinners. Romans 3.25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Two, the rationale of the incarnation of God the Son, Hebrews 2.17, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Three, the heavenly ministry of our Lord, 1 John 2.2, 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And four, Packer speaks of John's definition of the love of God. 1 John 4.10, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. But then we have to talk about the meaning of propitiation. What is the meaning of propitiation in those four mentions of the word in the New Testament? Well, we must first consider the difference between expiation and propitiation. Expiation is simply the removal of sin's guilt. In a way, it's a more general word. Propitiation is specifically the removal of sin's guilt by the placating, pacifying, appeasing, or conciliating of God's wrath. The 1689, chapter 8, paragraph 5, speaks of propitiation when it speaks of how Christ fully satisfied the justice of God. What is the means of propitiation? Well, Christ satisfied God's justice by actually suffering in our place, and so he placated it, propitiated it. Representatively and substitutionarily, he suffered, bearing the punishment God's justice demanded. That penalty was death, the physical emblem of divine abandonment. A divine abandonment. Hell is the place where God abandoned sinners. Christ was abandoned by God on the cross. Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Passages teaching Christ substitutionarily suffered the punishment of our sins confirm this idea of propitiation. 2 Corinthians five twenty-one reads, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3.13 also teaches this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. But all of this leads, and by way of application, to the misconceptions of propitiation. Uh, or some uh, under, some proper understandings of propitiation in light of common misconceptions. Here's the first thing we ought to learn. To love someone and to be propitiated towards someone are not the same thing. God loves men with whom he is angry. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Ephesians 2, 3, we too were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But we were children of wrath, even as the rest, in spite of the fact that Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 teaches that in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. So to love someone and to be propitiated towards them are not identical. But second, Propitiation does not turn a God of wrath into a God of love. 1 John 4.10 is clear. He loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God loved us, but the Son still need to be sent to be the propitiation for our sins. Third, 
Propitiation does not detract from God's love and mercy, but shows how costly, determined, glorious, and secure it is. We imagine the difference between a man who marries a woman and a man who marries a woman he first must purchase at a great price out of slavery. Which man's love is the most impressive?